We're fragmented people. That's the reality of it. See, we, we break our lives up into our work lives and our home lives, our church lives, our sports lives, our hobbies, our relationships, and we don't really let these things run into each other. We just subdivide off these little pieces of ourselves and hope that each one can kind of make it on its own. We have our, our relaxing lives separated from our productive lives. And, and we hope that our, our rejuvenating life can, can make up for all the mistakes that our, our hardworking and strenuous life can handle. And that maybe someday they'll balance each other out. When I was in high school, I was in drama and I loved drama. I, I would study and I would memorize, I would work together with people and I would figure out how I could get all those lines in my head and that character in me so that I could be somebody else. And it took a lot of practice and it, and it was really terrifying, like really terrifying. Like I had major stage fright. I had no business being in drama. But what I figured out is after all of that practice and all of that rehearsing and all of all of it, just months and months, I'd be able to stand backstage, just a ball of nerves, and then, and then cross that threshold. And when I crossed that threshold, something really awesome would happen every time if I was rehearsed. I'd step across that threshold and I would become someone else. All of that worry, all that fear, all that anxiety would just melt away. And I could just breathe out this other person. And it was really cool because it was a massive adrenaline rush. And I used that to hide my own insecurities. But I did it in kind of a healthy way because I could, I could entertain and I could do something positive with that as an outgoing of who I was. So it was kind of a two-edged sword. I was, I was hiding who I was, my own insecurities of being on stage, but I was also expressing that and working through it in a positive way to do an awesome thing. After I graduated from high school, um, I went to college and then I got a job and I found out that people do the same thing in a job. People hide who they really are. You see, we're trained to hide who we really are. We're trained to, you know, put up a nice Zoom background to make sure nobody sees who you are, where you're going, what your interests are, or anything really. And you just have a static view of a static life. See, when I got my first job, it was a big corporate job. And I got to do a lot of really cool things. Um, worked at IBM for a little bit, worked at Rockwell Collins for a little bit. And the cool thing was I got to I got to see a little bit behind the scenes. You see, people always wanted to hide who they were and what they were doing and, and separate out their professional life from their personal life. And, and I oftentimes try to break through those. I tried to see what people were hiding. So I followed the example and I hid my own personal life and I only showed people the professional pieces that I learned when I was in college. The software engineer, the technician, the leader. And, and there were some pieces of me that were missing. And I noticed that in other people, every once in a while, there'd be this little crack where I could see into their personal lives just a little bit. And I could see that 
they're real people too. They had real lives. They had real interests, real passions. And every once in a while, I'd catch a little glimpse. And so I was actually drawn to that. And as a result, I ended up in management. I became a team lead and, and I got to see a little bit more because team leads get to see a little bit more of some of that rough human stuff. That stuff that everybody's always hiding from the rest of the team. That stuff that we're now seeing a little bit. You see, whether or not you see it in a corporate office, people have health scares. People have sick parents. People feel like they're in a dead end job or they feel like they're, they're stuck doing something they're not passionate about. And I had the privilege of seeing some of that. And it really made me curious. Can I be all of me at work? Is that even possible? And so I set out on this journey to figure out, can I be my whole self at work? Is that better? Is that actually helpful, desirable? I don't know. What's interesting is that these COVID times, lockdown and Zoom, is making it so that we can actually see into other people's lives in ways that we've never been able to see into people's lives before. Because you've got people, especially very much at the beginning, people didn't have a work from home setup necessarily. So you could see into their living room. You could see into their bedroom, maybe their closet. Sometimes they'd have kids running by. Sometimes they'd have a dog jump into their lap or the doorbell ring for a delivery. Sometimes you'd see roommates. Sometimes people would have to leave because something was going down with school, with their kids. And somehow in this tragedy, work collided with life. And it seems like work should have collided with life all along. And somehow we had figured out how to separate the two. COVID has provided an interesting opportunity. You see, it let us see through some of those cracks in ways that a lot of team leads and managers have seen, but ways that a lot of the rest of the workforce hasn't. You see, we get to see into people's living rooms into their kitchens and their closets when their cat interrupts or if they have to leave because something's going on with their kid. We're getting a glimpse into these cracks that are showing us that people aren't one dimensional drones. They don't just come to work and fix the code or fill out the report or who knows what they do over there sitting in their cubicle. They're human beings. They have a life, they have passions, they have desires, they have weaknesses, they have frustrations, short tempers, they have dinner time. They've got life. And we have spent far too long pretending like everybody around us just a one-dimensional drone, and that's not okay. And so you ask, how do you bring your whole self to work? Should you? I would argue it actually is helpful, and you can actually be more productive, more helpful, more engaging with your coworkers. How do we do that if on the inside we really are just sniveling heaps of emotions, insecure, and feeling like we don't have anything to bring to the table. That's how I feel a lot of the time. 
In fact, that's how I felt a lot of the time leading up to last year's DEF CON. Because last year, I decided that I was going to do something completely different. I was going to, to bring my whole self and talk about workplace happiness and what truly underneath it all makes it possible to have happiness, no matter where you're working. And it was really hard for me because an integral part of that was my faith. And I was taught growing up and I was taught in every job I've ever had that faith has no place in the workplace. That the things you never talk about are religion and politics. Well, it turns out that those are things that are close to people's hearts. Those are things that people have very strong opinions on, not for short conversations, not for little snippets and sound bites, but for actual hard conversation. And so bringing that last year really opened up my perspective to how it could actually be useful, how I can actually use everything that I am and bring it to work. And maybe, just maybe, I'd be better for it. How do you do this? I've got three tips, three things that can help. The first one is to act decisively, genuinely, transparently. Easy, right? That's the first one. That's not all three. Acting genuinely and transparently is actually really hard. And that doesn't mean coming out and yelling at people and telling people your opinion is right and theirs is wrong. There's more on that later. What that means is trying to not divide out who you are into another piece. It means, in practice, caring about the people around you, asking about what's going on in their life, and being willing to talk about what's going on in your life. So, invite somebody out. Say, hey, let's have lunch. Especially over Zoom, super easy, because they're gonna eat lunch at home, you're gonna eat lunch at home, and you both have Zoom, or Microsoft Teams, or whatever it is you use. You can say, let's have a talk. I just wanna hear your story. What is your story? And you'll be surprised. A lot of people have really cool stories. Where they grew up, how they grew up, hobbies they tried, things that got them into the field that they're in, things they're passionate about on the side. One of my favorite things to ask somebody is, what do you do for fun? Because a lot of people, for some reason, have a very poor view of their job but they almost always have a very high view of what they do for fun, because they do it for fun. And something that people are passionate about makes great conversation. I usually learn a lot about stuff along the way. So, pull somebody aside. Say, hey, tell me your story. Because what that does it does two things. The first thing it does is inside of you, it makes you think of them as a whole person, not just whatever their job title is, engineer, designer, marketing, sales, whatever their title is, it makes you think outside of that. And so it does some work in you, but it also does some work in them because what it says to them is, I care about you. You have meaning and purpose. I'm not just trying to get something out of this. I actually care for you because you are a human being that's in my proximity. And that means something. And that changes people. It'll change their reaction to you. It'll change how much of a character, caricature you make of them and how much of a caricature they make of you. We end up making these false pictures of people and then we attack the false picture instead of engaging with human beings. And that's dangerous. So, act genuinely and decisively 
move forward with confidence past that, that feeling of nervousness and fear. Just like when I was in drama, especially with practice. Once you cross that threshold, you move past your insecurities and you move into something that's actually really awesome and pretty fulfilling. The second thing is to love goodness, kindness, and compassion. And to love it means that you really want it for yourself and for others. <sighs> That's hard. That's hard sometimes. I definitely meet people where I'm like, you know, I don't really want goodness and kindness for this person. Which means I need to check myself because we're all in this together. We're all going through struggles. We all have insecurities. We're all human. And we need each other to get through all of this. What's one way that you can actually do something about that? One thing you can do is you can keep an eye out for emotional bids. It's these cracks. And this doctor, Dr. John Gottman, um, had this, this whole study that he did. It was popularized in Malcolm Gladwell's book called Blink. So if you've read that book, this might sound familiar. An emotional bid is when somebody goes out on a ledge emotionally to do something. A lot of times it's actually subconscious. So um, I had an awesome weekend and then they pause. What they're actually doing is they're saying, please ask me about my weekend. An emotional bid can be anything from something like that that's super obvious to a sigh at the end of a, of a statement. <sighs> because they're asking, they're begging. Something deep inside of each and every single one of us wants so badly to have a human connection. And that's not weakness. That's being human. And so we can respond to that by either saying, I accept you, I want to know you. Or you can respond by saying, you have no value and I don't care about you at all. And your response has more to do with you than it does them. The third thing that you can do is you can walk in humility. And this one is also hard. These are all hard. Because none of us have actually figured this out, this human thing. All the people that say they figured it out harbor a lot of anxiety inside and uh, are trying to figure life out too. Usually they're trying to sell a book so they can feel validated that they have figured out. <laughs> the most joyful people are the people who acknowledge that they don't have it figured out and they come into life with a, a humble attitude. So walking in humility, recognizing that you don't have all the answers, that you don't have everything figured out, and that you're willing to give somebody else that kind of grace and leeway as well. So how do you do that? One way that I found effective is to go on long walks. Some people do meditation. Some people do, I don't know, fishing or skiing or things that take you away to something else that's bigger and grander than you. Stargazing is a great one. Me, I like walks, but it's not just any kind of walk. It's the kind of walk where I'm silent and I look at the things around me and I, and I turn that into gratitude for things that I, that I see around me that I didn't work for, that I don't deserve, or that other people have worked just as hard for or more and they didn't get it, which means that I could have worked 
as hard for or harder and still not received it. I have nice fitting clothes. I have a beautiful bald head. I have a house. I have a family that loves me. I don't deserve any of those things. Because I know a lot of people that have worked very hard that are missing some of those things through no fault of their own. So that shouldn't make me feel like I'm deserving of those or better than. What that should do is that should work on my heart so that I am more grateful and thankful for the things that I do have. So thankfulness and humility go hand in hand because one of them leads to the other one. Humility leads to thankfulness. It also uh, changes how you interact with people because people, <laughs> some people, some people are very bullish in their opinions. And even if I think they're dead wrong, if I humble myself, I can still approach that conversation with respect. I can still approach that conversation with a, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this is the way things are. Um, and if you'll dialogue with me, if you'll work with me, maybe we can see each other's point of view and how we got there. Because I don't know where you came from. You might not know where I came from. Maybe I should hear your story. Maybe I should share a little bit of my story. We can figure out how we got here, how we got to disagreement, how we got to frustration. And we can figure it out together. You can only do that through humility. Because if you think you already have the answers, why would you bother hearing them out? We're fragmented people. We've divided our lives into a bunch of different pieces. And we're in a place right now where the cracks are starting to show. And this isn't a new problem. This isn't a problem for the modern era. This is a very, very old problem. In fact, in the eighth century BC, there was a man by the name of uh, Micah of Morisheth. It's a fun place. And, and he had some things to say about this. He said, you have an image to keep up. You have passions to strive after, missions to devote your life to, money to be distracted by. But what is actually required? To do what is right, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, we're fragmented people, and it's not new. But there's these three things that we can do about it. We can do what is right. We can love kindness and compassion. And we can walk in humility. Last year on Workplace Happiness, I gave so many different suggestions on things you could do. And honestly, I don't know if any of them were actually followed through on. So this time I'm just doing three. The first thing, is to ask somebody about their life. Show genuineness and transparency. Invite somebody to lunch and ask about their story so that you can know more about them. The second thing is to follow up on some of those emotional bids. When people are asking they're begging to be known, to be heard. Follow up, reach out to them. Make sure that you are, you are letting them know that you care about who they are as a whole person, not just as a drone, not just as somebody that can do something for you, but who they are. And the third thing is to go on a long walk. Think about the things in your life that that are bigger than you, 
that you don't deserve so you can build that humility so you can build that genuineness so you can build that kindness I don't know if anybody's actually going to do these things but I think these three things are three things that we desperately need in these times when we're isolated when we're separated when we are when we're by ourselves working in our offices wondering if anybody actually cares and if any of it is if any of it really matters like what are we doing we need to be building these communities we need to be building these relationships because in the end those are the things that matter we need to figure out how to bring our whole selves to work to church to sports into our politics into our into our every bit of our lives because we can't keep on living as fragmented people we are whole people and we need to start acting like it these covid times have really made it obvious that there's more to people's lives than meets the eye so it's time to stop pretending it's time to start doing something about it i'm trying to i hope you are too I think we're open for questions. That's correct. Thank you, Robert, for that wonderful presentation. We have quite a number of minutes available for questions directly to Robert. Feel free to use the Q&A module in Zoom uh, to submit those questions directly to us and uh, get you some answers. And this is one of the disadvantages of not having a big room with people in them. Right. <laughs> Can't stare them in the face. We do have a question from Wendy. Uh, can you share the chapter and verse reference in Micah? Yes. So it's actually uh, Micah 6 8. Um, with uh, basically the entire book as context. Feel free to throw in thoughts, observations, whatever you want in the chat if it's not a question or in the questions if you have a question. Here we go. What uh, made you decide on this particular topic? What experience or musings led you to want to talk about it? Uh, well, uh, we have a lot of difficulty with transparency. Um, it kind of started off with how we, I mean, being able to see into people's kitchens really was a big piece of it for me. Um, going into Zoom meetings and and seeing like some people had it set up like in their in their master bedroom or you know you kind of I don't know especially in those bigger meetings where like I didn't necessarily have to have my video on but people kind of felt like they should. And you know, if it was a boring topic, I'd find myself just, you know, kind of looking into the, did you know if you double click on somebody in the gallery view, you can full screen anybody, you can just pin them. And then you can just kind of be like, wow, like, you can you can kind of look at their bookshelf behind them or you can, you know, it, it sounds kind of creepy, but it helped me empathize more with my coworkers. And every once in a while, you know, I chat with somebody and go, hey, where are you? Cause I cannot figure it out. And they go, oh, I'm actually in my closet. And we set up this screen right here so that I can work in here. And so that kind of helped break my brain enough to start asking those questions. And then as I chatted with people about it, realized that that's a really, it's a really big thing. And it's a very high stress thing.
thing that we we suppress um, and, and make it so that we just have our one little like corner of ourselves as our work selves. I think it's dangerous and, and it harms not only us, but the people around us. Absolutely. Good segue into another question. What is behind you? Oh, so uh, to be transparent, in most of my meetings, I have a Zoom background up because I'm a, I'm a pretty neat and clean orderly person and my office is not that. So behind me is actually down here, it's a pile of junk. Can I move this? Pile of junk. Um, and back there is um, shelving from another, our guest bedroom and uh, sewing stuff. I actually built my wife a desk in this closet over here. Oh, she'd kill me if she knew I was showing you this. This is probably not being recorded, right? It's going on YouTube um, too. <laughs> um, and it's because we um, we cleared out our guest bedroom where we you know dumped all of our stuff and we put it in that closet over there. And uh, my nephew's come to stay with us for uh, for a year after he's graduated as a gap year to learn about what life is like, um, not with his family because every family is real different. And so we just moved all of our junk from in there and just dumped it in here, uh, right right close to when you know all of this started. And I just haven't clean it all up all right where are your favorite places to go on a walk i i actually really like walking around my neighborhood mainly because it's close and convenient um, there are so many little windy paths and different roads that are dead ends or not dead ends and so i most mornings will take one of my two dogs and we'll just go and i'll try and take a different route i've got kind of a normal route but i try and break it up so that they don't think they know where they're going but if not, I actually really like the green belt because it's like it's like a five minute drive and then it's you know either direction as far as the eye can see. Exactly. You have some kudos and compliments, very inspiring. Uh, empathizing, I also have a huge pile of junk in my office. Excellent presentation. It's been a while since I've heard someone talk about bringing their whole self to work, sharing their life, learning to invest some time in learning about their coworkers. So refreshing to hear these things, thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions related to humility. So Jim asks, can you talk a little more about humility? Quote, things you don't deserve, unquote. Does, that, does this mean things you can't earn or buy? Tell us more. Um, so what I was talking about was uh, taking a look at the things around you and recognizing your place in relation to them. Uh, and so that's, that's helped me. There's a lot of different ways to uh, work on humility. For me, it's to, to basically look at other people's uh, work and accomplishments and recognize that they've worked a lot harder than I have and may or may not have the same opportunities afforded to them. Uh, I feel like I've grown up in a very um, privileged place for a lot of reasons. Um, not necessarily financially until I you know, got out of college and got an engineering job, but in, in a lot of other contexts, I grew up with you know, a, a loving family. Um, I got to travel internationally as a child. Um, I, got, you know, I, I found an amazing wife who puts up with all of my shenanigans. And, and so what that does is it's those things that you can't earn, which are not necessarily things, they're not necessarily um, monetary things, but, but it puts it in perspective. And there are things like that, like stargazing or uh, going hiking in the mountains and just looking at things that are bigger and broader than you that put you in your place to go, I am not that amazing. Um, and, and that's really important because what that does is it allows you to come into conversations where you can genuinely ask somebody about them because they are amazing. And yeah, and that, that helps just with every interaction I've ever had when I'm using it, which is not to say that I use it often but I try to, which helps. <laughs> right. What well, was a time where you really struggled with humility and opening yourself up to someone else's point of view? Um, so when I first, well, so when I first moved to the States, I, uh, in, for college, because uh, I grew up in Indonesia and Malaysia, um, anywhere where I first arrived somewhere new, I always feel very 
very, it, usually it's when I'm very insecure. And I feel like I need to put up a, a strong um, shield or facade so that people uh, will respect me and like me. And, uh, and so usually it's, it's right when I get into a new situation. So when I first moved to the States, when I got my first job um, out of college, when I moved to Idaho, when I, you know, every first job I've ever had, especially at the beginning, and usually it takes a little while for me to relax a little bit and to realize that it's okay. I can be transparent about who I am. I can, I can talk to people. I can, um, I can, you know, especially one-on-one, -on -one, it's really good to, be more and more transparent uh and that's that's been a, a long journey for me this is not this is not a i've done this well this is a this is a thing that i'm doing right now intentionally uh that i'm trying to get better at absolutely did you have to adjust to the vulnerability required to be complete with people who are not close friends and if so how did you approach it with caution um, it, it, so this is the hard part, right? This is the, because we, we guard against other people because we're afraid that they're going to hurt us. And if we are vulnerable, if we, if we expose something about ourselves that uh, might be uh, countercultural or it might be looked down on, then it opens us up to attack. And that is really hard. And so, I, in, in the least brave way possible, try and just slide things, little, little side notes in here and there um, in the sneaky way to pretend that I'm you know, being brave about who I am. And then, and, and then I notice that, oh, nobody cares or that sparks an interesting conversation. Um, and, and very slowly over time, I've realized that almost nobody will attack you for those things. Most people want to be known and it's actually really helpful if you do those things by just, you know, you can just mention that like you really like or whatever, or you've got, you know, you know, like you, you know, a hobby that you have to, to tie work and hobbies together or um, to, you know, make mention of your, you know, your baking hobby because I like baking um, or to make mention of your children or of, you know, things that you're passionate about, a cause that you care deeply about, and just mentioning those, uh, it, it offers an opportunity. It is, it is one of those social bids. It is, uh, it's a side comment that people have the opportunity to follow up on. And I think what we do is we, we stop ourselves from giving those, those little bids for a connection. And, and if we don't offer them intentionally, then people aren't going to respond because they don't see them. And so not only do you have to be offering those for people to pick up and not shut down if nobody does, you have to also pick up on other people's bids. So when somebody says, this weekend, I painted my first amazing painting or I, finished, or I, um, I got to um, do a, a, community, um, a community theater presentation, or that's what I'm doing this weekend. Uh, to follow up on that would be to ask about it, to ask about their participation and how it's, how it's part of their passion instead of just being like, oh, well, I'm going and doing whatever. Like it's following up on those things and it, it goes both ways. And so it's, it's having those little bids and then slowly it builds the confidence to have more of that. I like it. Which I think follows up into that next um, humility versus confidence and what Correct. that balance yeah. is. Yeah, go ahead and answer that. The humility versus confidence, how to balance those. So you can have strength in humility. Um, I, think that, I think that a lot of times we put confidence and humility on different ends of the spectrum, but I think that those are actually on the same side. I think that humility is the opposite of arrogance, or at least those are on a spectrum. There's different spectrums you can probably tie. Um, and so you can be confident where you are, but knowing, having the humility to know that you don't know everything and that you're willing to hear somebody else out. Uh, and I think that's really important. So if I am, I, if I've spent 35 years in a field and I've studied everything there is to know about it, I can be confident in what I know. But if some, somebody new comes into the field and they bring something from somewhere else and they challenge my opinions or my assertions or my whatever, 
Um, I need to have the humility to not just shut them down, but to open a dialogue and hopefully from a place of confidence, ask good questions and, and to open that communication rather than shutting it down. And that's actually where humility um, is a massive, massive strength because it actually creates that connection instead of dividing and creating enemies, which is what oftentimes what arrogance does. So I don't view those as opposites. Now, what I have seen, and this is the thing that I've struggled with, I don't see any other questions in there, so I'm just going to ramble for a bit. How much time do I have to ramble? Unless actually, more questions no, come in. Actually, no time. We, no. We, we have just hit our, our time. Um, really appreciate you, Robert, and the time that you've taken to chat with us about uh, bringing your whole self to work into all your relationships, for that matter. Uh, we want to remind everyone uh, that there's one more session left. Uh, so hang around and, and uh, stick around. We also remind you to take the survey that will pop up at the end of this meeting as soon as we end it. It should pop up in a little browser window for you. Uh, and it's also pasted in the chat window. If you go ahead and pop that up, you can fill out the uh, survey feedback to provide some feedback directly to Robert, uh, as well as to the DevCon committee about uh, how you felt like this breakout session went. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon.